Welcome Home with Barbara Beck, a Good Life 45 original production. Get ready to watch hope happen. Hi everyone, I'm Barbara Beck and I'd like to thank you for tuning in to Welcome Home. Today we're going to be talking about what the Bible has to say about living lives of comfort versus sacrifice. Are we called to coast through life, avoiding that which might make us uncomfortable? Or are we called to sometimes step out of our comfort zones and serve even when it's difficult or even undesirable? Well, recently I met a lady who serves others who are not exactly in what we might call her wheelhouse. She's white and she serves a black community. She's perhaps about my age and she serves young people. She has resources where they have few. And if we're being honest, we could say that she has very little in common with those that she's serving. So why is she dedicating her life to this mission? Well, we'll find out later on in the show about how this courageous, vibrant woman is helping transform lives in Washington shores. But first, let's talk to the current ladies to see how they're living lives of sacrifice versus comfort and what that really means. Well, welcome, ladies. Hey. Hi. Hi. Glad to have everybody here with us today. It's good to be Excited here. Excited to be here. Any examples of sacrifice over comfort? Definitely. Okay. When I first got married, we moved into what was my dream house. 3,000 square feet, beautiful home, and a really, really nice neighborhood. I grew up in a low income area, so this was every girl's dream, right? To have this beautiful home. Well, we'd been married for about a year, and I knew in my heart of hearts that God was calling us to move out of this house, back into the community, mm. and- The that, community, what do you mean when you say the community? The community where our church is. Okay. Which is also the community that I grew up in. Right, right. And I did not want to move back. I mean, I grew up there. First of all, I knew there was nothing there that was comparable to where I was, mm -hmm. where I lived already. And I did not want to do it. I mean, I struggled and I prayed and I cried and I struggled and I prayed. <laughs> and I remember being at the church on a Saturday morning for a women's ministry event. And when we got out of the meeting, my husband was standing outside waiting on me. And I walked outside and he said, there is something I need you to see. We probably had had, I don't know, 25 conversations about moving. And I finally said to him, okay, I'm ready. I mean, it took a lot of time and a lot of prayer for me to finally say yes, like six months. And no sooner than I said yes, did a house come available mm -hmm. in the community, like right around the corner from the church. We went to see this house and it was half the size of the house that we lived in. But I walked into the house and I said, I mean, I had one thing that I was asking God for and that was wood floors. I hated carpet, so I asked for wood floors. We walk into this house, we walk through the entire house, and there's the most disgusting carpet you've ever seen in your life <laughs> all over this house. But I come back into the area where we started, and the Holy Spirit said, lift up the edge of the carpet. Oh, wow. And I lifted up the edge of the carpet, and the most beautiful hardwood floors mm. you've ever seen in your life was hiding underneath oh, that carpet. Wow. Wow. Long story short, it took us about a month and a half, maybe two months to get this house prepared for us to be able to move into. We downsized, we moved back into the community because we needed to get rid of the debt, if you will, yeah. that we were carrying with the bigger house so that we would have more to pour into ministry. Wow. We knew that God was calling us to sacrifice yeah. for the sake of ministry. Stayed in the smaller house for two years and then the house that was on the property with the church came available. It was a bigger house, but get this, I moved from a bigger house that was our house to a smaller house that was our house. And now God was moving us from a smaller house to a bigger house, but it wasn't gonna even be my house. Hmm. It was a property that 
we were going to be able to occupy, but the church was purchasing yeah. it. That was the most difficult thing yeah. ever for me. But I did it because I knew that we were called to make those sacrifices for the sake of ministry. As a result of, yeah. of making that first move, that second move, we were able to do so much more in the community. And it made the people in the community more open and receptive sure. to us because sure. we weren't driving in from some really nice neighborhood. Right. We were living in the community right. and we were with suffering with them. Yes. And so they knew that we understood yeah. Yeah. what their needs were. Yeah. And so here we are 20 years later and God has allowed us to do some really amazing things in that community but it wasn't from the outside in. We had to be in the community in order to be able to do it. And God gave me so much peace until when it was time to move from my small house, I didn't want to move. <laughs> I loved that little house. I mean, I did, I fell in love with it. God gave me a peace and comforted me in that transition. That is a great testimony. Yes. And there's something that I heard you say that I think is so rich to be able to be in a place of sacrifice so that we can understand. Mm -hmm. You know, that reminds me of Jesus. He wants us to live lives of sacrifice so that we can understand maybe what he went through. It's impossible to have true compassion yes. yeah. for someone when you have not walked in their shoes. Now you have to know, I grew up in this community, so I understood it very, very well. Well, if I can tell you this short story, we just opened the, the, the last, the newest complex housing development. And I probably have never told this story. Two of the apartment complexes that God has allowed us to purchase and renovate, my grandmother lived in those complexes. Oh, wow. I love that. And so mm -hmm. I'm standing on the property and I'm looking and I'm saying, God, mm. I, had to, I had to move back to this community mm. so that you could show yourself faithful and allow me to be able to see what you could do yeah. through us in this community that I thought was just it was, it was over, it was a waste. Mm -hmm. What an honor that God allowed you to see his lesson and his faithfulness. You know, sometimes I feel like we walk through seasons and we never necessarily understand why God has taken yeah. us through those seasons. And so I believe when you get the gift of, of seeing his faithfulness and seeing the purpose behind it, you know, he doesn't have to share any of his purpose no. with us ever. Um, but when we get to see that, I think it's really such a great gift. That's so sweet. Well, Barbara, I think we're so blessed still, right? We're mm -hmm. so blessed in this mm -hmm. country. That is like, we mm -hmm. are such a blessed nation. And I think we have a hard time even recognizing what sacrifice is or what comfort actually is until we yeah. are in the mission field, right. until we go out and we see, oh my goodness, we are just so blessed. Every one of my children have their own room. I mean, you just think about that. Like, yeah. you know, you see families that all live in other countries, all live together in one room houses and that kind of dirt thing. Dirt floors. And dirt floors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, we have a mission in Haiti. And that is just, we come back to America after we've been to Haiti. And I'm just like, oh, I just want to give everything. Away. You know, you just feel like you just want to give everything away. And you're like, oh, my goodness, we are just so blessed. But we are blessed to be a blessing. Mm -hmm. And God moved you there. And you, you, he's blessed you to be a blessing in that community. And that's the truth we're supposed to be. But Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. Right. I mean, he was, I, I was thinking about Ephesians 5, 2 this morning. And, um, and the word says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So if, if Jesus gave himself up as yeah. a sacrifice aren't we supposed to sacrifice, mm -hmm. you know, some things, some of our, our excess, some of our blessing to be a blessing to others. Yes, mm -hmm. we are. Sacrifice hurts. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sure. And that's what we don't realize yeah. is, you know, we think we're sacrificing. If it's not painful, mm -hmm. if it's not causing you some yeah. difficulty, it's probably not real true sacrifice. You know, it's funny, I, I'm sitting here just well in my spirit all the times in my life that um, God's called me to sacrifice, to let go. And it's funny, and I know we're all gonna say this after I say it, you're gonna go, yes. I fight him, I fight him, I fight him because I'm so afraid. Mm. I'm so afraid that what I think he's asking me to let go of, mm -hmm. that it's because he wants me to have less. <laughs> Instead of recognizing that my Father in Heaven is asking yeah. me to let go of something because He wants me to have 
more. Mm -hmm. It's the best mm -hmm. for you. And, and it's all about how we view it. And now that I'm, I'm getting a little bit more mature in my life, I'm coming to that it's easier to let go of things because I realized when I didn't let go of it and I kept it, it was so bitter in my mouth. It, it didn't bring the happiness. It never, there's never enough money. There's never enough fame. There's never, mm. your pride's never, it's yeah. never sustainable. There's, there's not enough that the world can offer, right? Mm -hmm. But it's that whole story. I, I come back to that. I tell it to the girls when I speak to them about the little girl that had the pearl necklace, I right? Like that. And I, it's just, I know there's somebody sitting out there today that you're hanging on so tight to something because you're so afraid that what God's asking you to give up, it's less. But God wants you to give those little penny pearl necklace because he's standing there with a real pearl necklace. Yeah. And he, he wants us to be blessed. He wants good things for us. And I mean, we're just going through right now. I hear God knocking on the door again mm. saying, let go of it. Let go of it. Sometimes I just think he wants us to see where our hearts are. Yes. What, what are we idolizing? What are we putting up on pedestals? Is it Christ or is it something of this world? And I'm now I like, take it, take it. You can have it. Ooh, want that too? Just, I don't want it because I know where God is leading us that, yeah, it might be a little bit of the pain of letting go because of the fear. But once you get through that point, and you can walk in that faith and you can get to the other side, it's so free. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gonna sound crazy, I know I'm taking too much time, but I think now of people who go to work overseas, I used to think, oh my Lord, they're giving up everything. Now I think, oh thank you Jesus, a smaller house to take care of, they don't have to worry about all. Mm -hmm. there, there's really a freedom. Yes in the letting go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it just, I, I was thinking about something funny when you were saying it was such a blessing she got to see why God did this and the fruit of it. But I think about our kids when it's time to like, I, before Christmas or before their birthdays, I always make them go through their toys, you know, cause you know they're gonna get more. You know they're gonna just get all these new things. So you're like, okay, it's time we're gonna go through. What have you not played with in a while? And I learned by my fourth child, I gotta do it when he's at school, okay? <laughs> cause I, you know, by the, the first few, they're just like, oh no, that's my favorite. And I'm like, I have not seen you with that in about eight years, right? And it's like, no, we're gonna, you know, but they, it all of a sudden becomes their favorite toy, right? right? And you just have to be like, okay, but until I finally learned with my, my last few, I wanna show them where it's going. I want to show them why we're giving them up. We're not just, you know, getting rid of two yeah. bags of toys because you're going to get new toys for Christmas, that kind of thing. I want them to know where it's going. So we started, you know, taking them when we go do the missions and this kind of stuff. And, and we went to a hotel one time and homeless families living in a hotel that, you know, I explained to the kids, you know, we, when we would say, do Santa when they were little, I was like, yeah, Santa. And they were like, will Santa come to the hotel for them? I'm like, Santa knows where they are, right? And, you know, we would do this. Okay, it's terrible. I'm sorry if you don't do Santa. Yeah, all right. But anyway, <laughs> so we um, we would take them to the hotel, and, and we gave their toys to a lot of these homeless families that were living there. And the kids were so excited about their one and two little things. And their faces when you got back in the car, and your kids feel so proud that they gave them. And... And you would just have a conversation and say, don't you feel really good that you shared that? And they're like, mommy, do you think they have any other toys in their room? And do you mm -hmm. think, and all the questions, because mm -hmm. they started realizing, wow, I'm so blessed. Mm -hmm. You know, they need to see that, that they don't have any idea until they get in there and see how blessed they are to see, you know, why we do share, yeah. why we share our food with the hungry, why we share our clothes with the needy, why we do that, because you're very blessed and we're supposed to be a blessing, so. Mm -hmm. Well, Deborah talked about it on another show previously, and I, I just love, I love when it really hit me hard is because it's all about our heart. Yes. This self-sacrifice thing, it's not because God doesn't want us to have it. He owns the cattle on a thousand yes. hills. It's not about the stuff. It's what's hanging, what, what's hanging on to us. It's the heart, and that's what you were talking about. And, you know, I always come back to Cain and Abel. It, for me, it's like when I go and minister, if I go sing, I don't care if there's 10 people or 200,000 people. I'm going to give it everything I have because I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for Christ because I'm not going to give my spotted calf because it was a heart issue. He didn't want to give right. his best. He didn't want to give it up. He, he loved it more. And God was saying, really? I'm the one that's just gave you everything that you have and you don't trust me to give you more. And, and I love when you said that it, it really is about our heart. It's he is such a good, good father. I love that song, don't you? I do love that song. And you, um, 
uh, we always get you to sing a song, Carolyn, whenever you start bringing up songs. So you have to be careful about that because I usually say, <laughs> okay, just break out a song. But I'm not going to have you do that because I want us to know and recognize, you made me think of this, is that we think that music is worship, right? And it is, and it can be. It can be one of the greatest ways that we can worship. But the verse in Romans talks about living your lives as living sacrifices, which is your spiritual worship. It is a way to worship is to live our lives as sacrifices and not a one-time sacrifice. You didn't move to the community and then move out again. It was a one-time thing. You live every day as a living sacrifice, and that's a way to worship God, which I just think is really kind of cool. I I, I agree. I love that. I think that um, what God has really been imparting on my heart recently is um, just obedience. Yes. Just be obedient to mm-hmm. me. And I'm not going to tell you why, and I'm not necessarily going to show you my purpose in it, yeah. but you are called to be obedient and trust that I'm going to take care of you. Because mm-hmm. I said so. Because I said just so. Just like we say to our kids right. sometimes, he's our daddy, right? Mm-hmm. That's right? Because I said so, and mm-hmm. we don't have to know, but maybe he'll give us a glimpse in heaven someday. Right. Or, you know. Right. But how many times have you stepped out of your comfort zone and you've done something that really is kind of a sacrifice? I mean, I think of you ladies coming here and doing this all the time with me. And I've said this before on the air and I'll say it again. These ladies don't get paid to do this. They come because it is a living sacrifice to come drive their car on I-4 and get here and get all dolled up and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to share the gifts and the talents that God has given you, you know, that is a sacrifice. And you may not think it because you're like, oh, I love it. I love I'm in ministry and I love what I'm doing. It's so much fun. And it is fun, but it's also a sacrifice. The other day I, I interviewed somebody who really was so shy and so out of his comfort zone, he did not want to be there. And I thought, that is just so great that he would be willing to step out of his comfort zone and sit on the couch with me and have a conversation with me, even though that wasn't what he wanted to do, but he was living his life as a living sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Makeup, Barbara, is a living sacrifice for me because I'm a tomboy, <laughs> all right? No. I said I struggle more putting together outfits than I do right. writing the messages. Right. I, just, right. I do. I'm just... Mm-hmm. But, but it no. is. It is a sacrifice. I, you know, but they make me look good here on screen. Yeah, they so, do. Uh, and it's a, great, it's a great privilege to, <laughs> yes, it is. to be it here is. and to... I feel blessed every time because I feel like the Lord speaks through each one of you. And I learned things. Hopefully we all, we all learn something new, but it's just but I heard you just gift. say that it's such a privilege and it's so wonderful. Anytime we live our lives as living sacrifices, we should be feeling like this it's is a, a privilege. privilege when you're living in the community mm-hmm. in the 1500 square foot house that when you had a three, that, that was a privilege mm-hmm. and you were happy. But it didn't feel like it at first. Yeah. And right. that's the thing. Um, when you're called to do something that is going to take you outside of your comfort zone, that means it's going to be uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. When we first moved to that house, half of our half of mm-hmm. our stuff was in boxes, yeah. and they ended up in boxes that we never opened. Hmm. If that makes any <laughs> yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we moved from the from the small house to the other house on the property, and I finally said, "Why are we moving these boxes? The things that are in you this box, really we haven't them. used them yeah. for two years. So why don't we go through and donate some stuff or throw some stuff away?" It That's it great. got to a point where. It felt like a privilege. It felt like an honor because I was there on a day-to-day basis with the people that we were minister- called to minister to. But initially, it was extremely uncomfortable, and I didn't like it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I accepted it. I said yes to the Lord, but mm-hmm. it wasn't easy to take furniture that you bought for a 3,000-square-foot house and try to cram yeah. it into a 1,500-square-foot house. Yes. What are you doing with your kids, too, to help them see the importance of living their lives as living sacrifices? I mean, it's probably not something we say to our kids, but all of our kids, all my grandkids, my kids, are living pretty affluent, nice lives, right? Particularly Mo, as you said, when you think of Haiti and other third world countries out there. So are they in places where you're actually intentional about teaching them that word? Live your life as a sacrifice. Sacrifice. Give something up. Anybody? Well, I think that we have to do it. I mean, no offense, I start right in my home. I, I have a thing. I, you know, we've lost so much in our life. I, I'm really careful about the relationship inside with our children. And I want them to learn to be servants to each other. 
You know, it's not, oh, that's my brother, I can't stand him. No, don't start that. He's gonna be your best friend when you get older. Mm -hmm. So you yes. need to take care of it now. And so I make yeah. the now because we do it. If mm -hmm. they want a glass of water at night, my daughter might look at my son and say, Preston, would you go get me a glass of water? And he'll go, you know what, I'll go get that. Good. That's an act. No, it he's is comfortable, he's sacrifice. upstairs, yeah. he's, he's sure. but he'll get done. It's, it's in the little things. Yes. It's always in the little things. And you know, I looked up sacrifice. Can I tell what that yes. scripture, I mean, not but what it meant. It says, it's letting go of our comfort and surrendering something for the sake of someone else. Mm, that's great. I mean, can't we do that right yeah. inside our home with sure. our husbands? Yes. With, you know, it, when we're tired and our husbands say, no, can't we surprise him when he walks in at day? I try now to... you're really meddling oh, here. Oh, oh, really I'm honestly. a meddler. What can honestly. I say? But you know, <laughs> but it's that self-sacrifice. It's doing that thing that seems uncomfortable. Absolutely. To sacrifice, not for my gain, but for someone else's right. gain, right. you know? Mm -hmm. Can I brag on my husband a second? Because I was really, this morning, I've been busy for the past three days in the ministry. I had to preach. Then we were working at the story yesterday. Just been really busy. And I knew I had to have all my outfits ready. And I said, I struggle with that. But I, as I was getting in the shower doing stuff, my husband ironed all my clothes. Oh my goodness. And, wow. And, you and I'll tell you, we're coming wow. over. He is, he's a better ironer than me anyway. So, but I mean, I just really think like that is, that was serving God when he served me this yes, morning and did absolutely. that because he got me out the door in time. You That's know, right. that was yeah. such a blessing to me. So, you know, we need to do that for our family. We love to go help the stranger down the street and we forget we're supposed to be loving on those little disciples yeah, in our house. I that. think that's so important. Well, and that goes along great with this verse that mm -hmm. I have, and it's um, in, from Hebrews 13, 16, and it says, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Yes. Mm -hmm. So That's when he sweet. was serving you, God was so pleased. Yes. Thank you, so ladies. Great. It's so important for us to remember and to be reminded from time to time um, that we don't need to live just lives of comfort, even though Jesus wants us to be comfortable. And there are lots of verses in Bible that he is the great comforter. He wants us comfortable, but then he also calls us out of our comfort zones to serve other people, to have a ministry where maybe it shakes you up a little bit. Maybe uh, being on television is not your ministry, but maybe it's something else. Maybe it's working in a homeless shelter. Maybe it's going to other places that are just not comfortable for you. That's okay. Honestly, I never thought I would be on television. I, this is not what I'm trained to do. I'm a teacher and, and taught in public and private school for many, many years. And God called me out of that very comfortable place into a place that for a little while was not super comfortable. It is now, I have to tell you now, I love it. I love visiting with you. I love visiting with the ladies. And, and God equips us is the whole point of that. If we live our lives as living sacrifices, He will equip us. He'll give us what we need to go out there to serve someone else and get out of our comfort zones. I'm so glad you joined us today. We have more coming up, so stay with us. Coming up next. I've searched scripture and nowhere in scripture do I find where you retire. Mm -hmm. That if God calls you to ministry, he calls you to ministry. And if you're not called to what you think is active ministry, you still have a ministry. Pray for us. Right. If you right. can't physically get out there and do something, yeah. pray for us. You know, Christians need prayer. Non-Christians really need prayer. Right. You're watching Barbara Beck on Welcome Home, where we share life-changing stories filled with hope. You're watching Welcome Home. 
bringing you life-changing stories filled with hope. When we talk about the importance of sacrifice over comfort, I think it's important for us to see a story where one woman's life has been impacted and she has impacted many people's lives because of her desire to go and to leave the comfort zone that she was so um, doing well in. She was thriving uh, as a deacon at a church and um, God impressed upon her heart to do more, to go and to serve in a place that really wasn't necessarily uh, some place that she would have chosen. So I think it's important for us to hear these stories. And not only is Patricia Roberts here with us today to tell her story, but she has brought somebody here with us. Patricia, thank you so much thank for you, being Barbara. here with us today. You are a deacon at the Episcopal Church of St. John the Baptist, right? Absolutely. And you've been there for how long? Since 1914 uh, in, in March. So four, a little over four years now. 2014. 2014. 2014, right. You're not 1914. No, I am listening. You can tell I was listening. I was like, wait, I know that she's not <laughs> Methuselah, right? Yes. <laughs> but I met you at the Orange County Jail Ministry. Yes, when we were did. walking out together and we introduced each, uh, each other to, um, introduced ourselves to each other. And you were so um, gracious. And I just thought, this woman has a story that we need to tell, particularly about going and leaving our comfort zone. Because you go into Washington Shores, yes. which is a predominantly less affluent, maybe even poor, could we say poor area? Part of it is, part of it isn't. But okay. we, we do have, you know, it's... Orlando Housing Authority okay. is very prevalent in right. our area. And is it predominantly African American? Predominantly well? African American. Okay, and here you are, this little white lady going into this area where most of the people there are black. Mm -hmm. What made you do this, Pat? Uh, it was ordained by God. Uh, I, he told me I had to leave Christ the King, and I did. I resigned and I went to St. John the Baptist. I had interned there 12 years prior. And I just went there to sit and to worship. And within three months, God called me to be their deacon. And from that, I was invited to join their current youth ministry. Mm -hmm. And that quickly involved in, I wasn't just helping with youth ministry. I was you, the new youth minister. At what age were you about that time? Oh, uh, mid-70s. Mid-70s. Yeah. I love. See, I love this. I yeah. love this story because we yeah. have Pat and Andre. I will introduce you to Andre <laughs> Jackson. Thank you for being here with us today. You are one of the people impacted by Pat's This ministry. is one of my success stories. One of your <laughs> wonderful success stories. That's great. But a, a lot of people today, Andre and Pat, they'll be watching who are maybe in their 60s and 70s and 80s, and they're thinking, my life's over. What do I have to do? I've served. I've done what I need to be doing. Speak to that. Now, I'll speak to that. You know, this month I will uh, enter my 79th year. Oh, wow. And uh, I've searched scripture, and nowhere in scripture do I find where you retire. Mm -hmm. That if God calls you to ministry, he calls you to ministry. And if you're not called to what you think is active ministry, you still have a ministry. Pray for us. Right. If you right. can't physically get out there and do something, yeah. pray for us. You know, Christians need prayer. Non-Christians really need prayer. Right. That uh, just cover us and, I've said and bring that. it on. Yes, thank you for that. I've said that so many times. My dad's last year of his life, I've told the story over and over again, I know. People get tired of hearing it. But I think it's important for us to hear is that he even said to me, Barbara, I've served my time. He was 87 years old, been in the nursing home for a year. I said, Dad, your life is not over. As long as you're in this home, you are continuing to influence people. He prayed for people. He uh, visited with people when they would come in. The nurses, the aides, they loved my dad. He had roommates all the time that they would visit back and forth. So it does not matter where your, what your situation is, what your circumstances are, you continue to minister until the moment that God calls you home. I believe amen. that. People ask me all the time, when are you going to retire? When's it time for you to retire? And I'm like you, Pat. I don't see anything in scripture that talks about retiring. We just might be rebooted into yeah. another area. Well, you, know, you know, God will put you where he calls you. And I don't think he ever calls us 
just go home and sit and veg out. Right, watch TV. Although it's pretty nice to watch Christian TV. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's not a bad thing to be doing. We want to discourage that. But we want you also going and getting out there and serving, even if it's just next door, right? God made us to be in relationship, number one, with Him. Yes. And to also be in relationship with His people. Yes. And, and it's to love one another. This is an unlikely relationship, right? Andre? I would say so, yeah. Yeah? Um, how, did you, how did you perceive this woman who was coming to you and wanting to be your youth minister, basically, right? Well, she was already a youth minister when I started going to church, and I just started going to the group, and the only way I could get there was I'd have to get a ride sometimes, and she'd be one to come get me okay. and bring me over there, and okay. that was helped a lot. Tell me a little bit, Andre, about your story about when you came to know the Lord. Did you, were you always a church goer? Were you always a believer in Jesus or was there a moment? Well, my mother was in school when she had me, so I had to go live with my grandparents and they were, of course, in the church. They were Episcopal in the islands. And so... In the, the island? Where, what is St. the island? St. Thomas. Oh, really? Yeah. And what brought you over here? Well, she stayed here. And oh, I see. And so you're, okay, gotcha. Yeah, so they raised me for a while and then I came up here. And... When I came up here, I kept going to church, and I've just been in church my whole life. Um, only time I wasn't was when I was in the Marines, because that was a different story. But okay. yeah, after that, I came back home and still going back to the same church I was when I left. So what do you remember as a youth having this precious little thing minister to you? What, what were some of the lessons <laughs> in life that she, she taught you? Um, basically, just to be a good person is the best way to show how Christians live. and. Okay. Um, that's all she really showed me. I know that you were telling me, Andre, that um, Pat was, um, that, that what you're doing right now is going to school, you're going back to college, mm -hmm. and you are also working. Yeah. And so, how are you serving? How are you doing what she told you to do to be a good person? Well, anytime I see someone in need, whether they ask me or not, I offer my help, and if they take it, they take it. If they don't, they don't. I don't try and preach to them. I just show them that, hey, good people exist everywhere. You don't have to be in your face about it. See, we have a lot of different personalities out there. And I think what's so sweet about you, Andre, is that you are a gentle giant. You know, you are somebody that people are not going to be threatened by. You're not going to go knocking on their door to try to evangelize them. But you're there and you're available. And I think that's important for us to recognize Absolutely. is that God has gifted each one of us in different ways. And your style of helping and serving and going out of your comfort zone might be different from, from Pat's style. Pat is like this courageous, bold, <laughs> Are you sort of in your face to people? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so well, I want to hear your story. Where does that come from? How did you come to know the Lord? I, how did I come to know the Lord? Uh, I was raised moderately in the church. We grew up in New York. But what does moderately mean? Moderately, uh, my parents sent me to church because it made them look good. Okay, so they didn't necessarily go. They, they weren't practicing. They did not necessarily go. They, they were Christians, but they were non-practicing Christians. Okay. And... My whole view of God was he was a bargaining agent. You know, if, hmm. and I, you know, God, if I do this, will you do this? Mm -hmm. And at the age of 34, I finally understood Jesus loves me, this I know. And God implanted in my heart a new heart. And I didn't want other youth, teenagers, Growing up, not knowing Jesus loves me, this I know. Right. That I don't want you to have to experience what I experienced. What did you experience that was so bad? It's scary out there not knowing Jesus. It is. It is. And it, it's, it's terrifying. Yeah. But I mean, and you weren't wayward. You weren't doing I, I drugs wasn't and wayward, alcohol. And but I, I, I lived in fear of the unknown. Mm. And when I... You know, I didn't discover God. He was there all along. Right. But when I had that aha moment, right. wow, you know, the fear was gone. There was a calmness. There was that assurance that I really belong to somebody, and I know where I'm going. Yeah. Now, I don't want to go there right now, right. but I know where I'm going. Oh, he's not done with you <laughs> no, yet. No, no, absolutely you. not. And it's like, you know, here, there, or in the air. You know, we're going to get this done. So this little 79-year-old, almost 79-year-old woman 
with a, with a countenance that just exudes love of Jesus. <laughs> when you walk into Washington Shores and you're working with middle school and high, high school, school girls and boys, how in the world do you relate to them and how do they relate to you? It took them a while to relate to me because, you know, here I am. I'm just this white chick that right. just showed up. Right. And, With you know, a collar, for goodness yeah. sakes. And, you know, and, and, and who are you? Yeah. And it takes time. Number one, you have to build up a relationship and trust. Mm -hmm. And they learned that I wasn't going anywhere. Hmm. And then they also learned, and this was accidentally, that I don't get paid to do what I do. You're a yeah, volunteer? I am a volunteer. And, and, and a deacon in the Episcopal Church does not receive a stipend okay. or a salary. Okay. So that it is a real you, sacrifice what you, you're doing. You're called to a servant ministry. Yes. You know, that I, I will sacrifice or give up part of my life. And I don't look at it as a sacrifice. Mm. That to me, it's, it's a blessing. Yeah. You know, I don't go to work. The youth ministry to me is a blessing. And, and to see young hearts, young lives come alive, lives changed. You know, I'm not racking up bodies in the pews on Sunday mornings because yeah. my one promise is I won't try to turn you into a little Episcopalian. I will try to turn you into a Christian, oh, I love somebody that. that loves the Lord Jesus with all their heart, with all their mind, and with all their soul. Yeah. And that's what's going to change them. And that's what will change the world. And we do it one person at a time. Coming up next. The love has got to be unconditional. But with love comes responsibility. That, you know, God didn't give us 10 suggestions. He gave us 10 commandments, <laughs> yes, you know, qualities. Right. And he's not telling us, no, 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 no. He's setting us boundaries to keep us safe. Mm. You're watching Barbara Beck on Welcome Home, where we share life-changing stories filled with hope. You're watching Barbara Beck on Welcome Home, where we share life-changing stories of hope. You were telling me about one of your relatives in law. You have a granddaughter. I have a you granddaughter. You have several grandchildren. I you have, have several grandchildren. Eight children, lots of ch grand grandchildren and, and great, great grandchildren. Children. Tell us a story about your um, grandson in law. Okay. Uh, going back to Christ the King and my years in youth ministry, I had a lot of boys and girls in youth. And I had one boy in particular that I just went to all the mothers and went, you know, your daughter can't date this young man. <laughs> well, the young man uh, was a delightful young man. He was just making a lot of bad choices. Mm -hmm. Well, he got caught by the law making a very bad choice and went, aw went away to a, one of our state penitentiaries and was truly penitent and did that 180 mm -hmm. and came back into what Jesus had really called him to be and realized it. And he and my granddaughter ended up uh, chaperoning a youth event and met. And now they are married and... <laughs> And so, and you call I, him the, I just, yeah, I just see how you know, God is a miracle worker. He is, he is. And, and, and he brings us into his own if we'll just let him. 
I, I yeah. just wish I could watch you working with kids and just, and you can attest to this, Andre, yeah. about how accepting and loving she is. But I can just see you telling these moms, don't let your daughters date yeah. this guy. And now this guy, you're related to him. He's married to your granddaughter. Oh, I love him dearly. And you love him, and he knows that. He absolutely knows that. So how, did you ever feel, Andre, like she was judging any of the kids? I know you were always a good kid. But but were, there were other kids in youth group that were probably like snickering and laughing and doing some things that maybe they shouldn't be doing. Um, no, she. That's what she was saying earlier about uh, getting trust from the other, uh, her new group. Yeah. That's mainly how she got me. It's like she was always there and always willing. It's like I knew she wanted to be there. And, and you could trust her. Yeah. What is it about her? Do you think? And I know that's kind of a question that's down there. What? Because see, I, I I did the same thing when I met her at that banquet. Mm -hmm. I, I was the same way. I was drawn to her. There was something about her that made me want to know more about her story. So what was it with you two? Just you could see she loved being there and wanted to do it. And yeah. I, I could tell that she wanted her honey any way she could. And so. Yeah. What about when there's some kids that are doing, and you know, Pat, you know when they're kids doing things. Kids. Yeah, kids are kids. So how do you go to them <clears throat> and tell them and rebuke them without feeling like you're pushing them away? Well, number one, you don't start off that way. Okay. <laughs> that, uh, they, they've got to learn to trust you and mm -hmm. accept you and hopefully love you, but there does come a time when you just slam your fist down and enough is enough. We're not doing this. <laughs> I can see you doing that, but yeah. in such love, right? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I love you, so I'm, we're, we're stopping right now and you're going home because, I, you know, to kill you is a sin. Mm, <laughs> so get, right, get, right. Get out <laughs> the more I do come something back, wrong. Come back next week. But, but you have to do that. The, the, there are lines that have to be drawn. Mm -hmm. That yeah, I, I'm all in this for Jesus, but I'm not going to lay down and let you walk all over me either. Yeah. And see, I don't see myself as this little old lady. No, I, I don't either. This, 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 <laughs> well, some, I don't somewhere either. in here, there's this 20 year old still trying to get out. Yeah. <laughs> she just didn't stay out that long. But uh, no, God never <laughs> ceases to amaze me. You know, we have a lock in twice a year. I get to sleep on the floor. Mm -hmm. God gives me the energy to do that. With these kids? With these kids. Okay. As long as I'm all in for him, yeah. he's going to give me everything I need and beyond. Yeah. What are some other things that you do? Okay, you've got the lock-ins, you've got the Friday nights, I guess, where you go and work we, with the kids. Yeah, we, the, the, we meet at the church and we have dinner and we always have a lesson. In about every six to eight weeks, we have a night where I just call it gloves off. Mm. You can ask me and my, my co-youth leader, Miriam, you know, anything you want to ask. And do they? They do. So you're willing to tell them anything and everything? I'm willing to tell them anything they need to know. Now, can you do the same thing with them? I can. They won't always answer me. Okay. But, yeah, that, that they... Once that trust is established, yeah. you know, they'll come tell me, you know, I did such and such this week and I, and I really shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a switch because some of them, not all, but a few, would show up on Friday night and want to tell you how many flights they'd gotten into mm -hmm. this week. And those are the girls, not the guys. Wow, wow. And that has switched. Mm -hmm. They're no longer proud when they've stepped into that moment. Mm -hmm. They're learning that it takes courage just to walk away. Let me ask you this, Pat. What do you, what sort of advice would you give to parents listening today to your story and the way that you deal with teenagers? Middle schoolers, they're tough. You know, Dobson used to say, put them in a barrel uh, when they're, you know, and then plug it up when they're middle schoolers. Oh, they're yeah, tough. Yeah. So there are some parents out there listening today who have wayward kids or kids who are, are go disrespectful or whatever the problems are. What sort of advice would you give to a parent needing to know how to deal effectively with a child? Number one, you've got to let them know no matter what you do, it's not going to make me love you less. It's the same condition. God our Father. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing we do is going to make him love us less or love us more. The love has got to be unconditional. But with love comes responsibility. 
they, you know, God didn't give us ten suggestions. He gave us ten commandments. <laughs> yes, you know, follow right. these. And he's not telling us, no, 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 no. He's setting us boundaries to keep us safe. Mm. Mm. And for parents, just be consistent. Yeah. And, you know, if you say, if you do such and such, I'm going to spank you, don't let that be an empty promise. Mm -hmm. You've promised them that. Give it to them. Mm -hmm. But hopefully it doesn't come to that. Right. But just keep on keeping on being the best parent you can. And yes, bring your child up in the church. Yeah. So because it, it takes a village. The church is your community of faith, that village right. of faith. So how do you get a high school boy who is big boy, like you might have been, Andre, and said, No, mom, I don't want to go to church, I'm not gonna go to church. Maybe you never said that, but but how does how does how do you deal with that? I wasn't always this big, but um <laughs> I did say I didn't want to go to church, and what she said is, well, it doesn't matter what you want to do, you're going to do it. Man. So your mom made you go? Yeah. What made you obey your mom? What would she have done if you'd said, nope, I'm sitting here, I'm staying in my room, I'm not going to church? I didn't want to find out. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, here's what it is. I think that I'm hearing from you, Andre, and what you've been saying is that your mom would follow through. Yes. She wouldn't just give you an idol and an empty threat. If you did not go to church, there would be consequences. It certainly would be. No. So I think that's that's real important for us to remember today as parents and even as grandparents. There are a lot of grandparents raising kids out there today, and they mm -hmm. need to be just like the parent. If you are the grandparent and you're in the role of being the parent, I'm sure you see this all the time, yes. grandparents that are raising kids. Are they raising them as grandparents, the doting grandmother that I am, that I give my, my grandkids pretty much anything they want? <laughs> well, my, my children tell my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren now, this is not the mother that raised me. <laughs> yeah, you know, right, right. right. So what's happened here? Yeah, yeah. But, so where do you see kids going today, Pat? There, it's a different generation, oh, obviously. It, 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 it's really a scary world out yeah, there. Yeah, it uh, is. That you know, drugs, alcohol, you know, you name it. It's, it's social media, there. the internet, and, and our society, be, being as we with all this internet and our media, social media, they're trying to tell you. What we have told you, don't do this, it will hurt you. You know, the world is telling them, it's okay, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, they're mm -hmm. just being fuddy daddies. Well, that hasn't changed. Yeah. And, you know, you just try to tell them, you know, what is good for them. And I have noticed, and, and I don't work with youth like you do, but I'm around some youth with my, my children and my, yeah. my grandchildren and all is that it appears to be, in particular with millennials, and you can speak to this because you are a millennial, Andre, yeah. is that there is not the respect for authority that there used to be. Back in my day, if a teacher told me not to do something, I would not do something. That I really respected that. I knew I would go to the principal's office or I knew there would be consequences. What do you see as far as being, as being a millennial and, and respecting authority? I can agree with you on that, that um, a lot don't respect. I, I, because I was, grew up to respect and obey, but everyone else in class looked at me like I'm the nerd, the geek, the... Uh-huh. So, so... Yeah, you were an anomaly because you didn't go... I mean, you weren't like everybody else. Yeah, so I don't know how to... We can fix it, but that's how it is now, and I don't know if we can go back. Well, here's one of my theories about that, is that the church, really, back in my day, I'm not sure how authentic we were. I'm not sure how truthful and honest the church was with us growing up. And I think that millennials in particular have picked up on that, and they're not going to put up with it anymore. They're going to say, I've been lied to, or, or they do one thing on Sunday and then do something else the rest of yeah. the week. And, and, and when there is a lack of respect for authority, then there's not going to be obedience for authority. And some of this we've brought on ourselves. Do you, are you tracking with me here? Do you uh, yeah, kind of see what I we've done? I with you. You can't have your private Christian life on a Sunday, mm -hmm. and then your private other life right. during the week. Right. That what you are in public mm -hmm. is the same thing you are in private. It's right. gotta be consistent. And, and will you foul up occasionally? Absolutely. But we serve a loving, forgiving God. Right. And, and that's the difference. We know where to go. Yeah, yeah. And we've got to teach our up and coming New citizens, where do you go? Yeah, yeah. Jesus is the only answer. 
And I want that to be a loud and clear message that we're conveying today. I want to also just speak for a minute because we're almost out of time, but how important family is. And, and not all these kids in Washington Shores that you're dealing with and not all the kids that, that we have in our circles of influence are going to have a healthy mom and dad relationship at home. There are, are broken, dysfunctional families all over the place. Yeah, absolutely. In, in Christ the King, I would say 50% of our congregation was divorced. And so especially for youth or even younger children that you're trying to get them to believe in a system where you have a loving God. Yes. Well, to have this vertical relationship when they don't have a horizontal relationship with a father figure, mm -hmm. that's a tough nut to crack. It is. But it can be cracked. Well, and yeah. one way I think the cracking can happen is by having mentors like you in their lives. We have other people that can come along beside the family. Um, we, we can have an Andre Jackson going out and working with young kids. You know, we got to get out of our comfort zones and we got to get out there in the world and, and affect some children and some teens in positive ways, especially those kids that don't have families. Amen. Is there one final thing you want to say? Because we are totally out of time, but I want to give both of you a chance to say one final thought if you have it. Just love Jesus. Love Jesus. And in loving him, we love each other. Absolutely. Ditto. Ditto. Good. <laughs> hey, you guys, this is a great success story. Andre Jackson, thank you for your heart and for loving Jesus and for being courageous enough to come on the air today and to show us that somebody that Pat has worked with through the years has come out of this alive, you know, with all that in your face <laughs> ministry that you've done. Look what you've done here. And, and Pat Roberts, Patricia Roberts, deacon of Episcopal Church of St. John the Baptist. Thank That's you so much. It is such a mouthful. <laughs> I appreciate you and your heart and your ministry and your faithfulness. And, and thank you, and God bless you for all you do. Thank you so much. Well, you know, it's been such a thrill and a joy to be able to speak to a woman in particular who has gotten out of her comfort zone, who is living a life of sacrifice. It's one thing to talk the talk, but after we hear about Jesus and we grow in him, well, what's next? Well, it's also walking the talk. We need to be going. We need to be serving. We need to be getting out there so that we can live lives that are abundant and victorious in Jesus. Stay with us. We have more coming up. Moments with Mo. There is no arriving in our walks with God. We don't set foot in our destinies and then he says, there you go, you made it, baby. Nope. I'd venture to guess and bet my life on it that until we make golden streets and pearly gates our home, and until we feast at the banquet with our co-heir and savior Jesus, we've not yet arrived. I just started writing my next book. Did I think I'd be starting a new book while I have two other manuscripts in the works and monthly messages to write? No, I didn't but God. The Lord showed me an area in which I'm still giving too much of my authority over to Satan. He showed me that I still have a stronghold that has to be broken. He showed me how to break it as I share with others how to break it. I'm so stinking excited I can't get over it. Yesterday and this morning were filled with such supernatural revelation, I felt like I could ask for the sun to stand still like Joshua and it would happen. Not that long ago did I feel like this, not so much. I was burdened with financial struggles, feelings of inadequacy in the ministry, and wondering if I was truly in God's will, writing and teaching. Come on, y'all, I'm just being real. But friends, God isn't done with me. He's not done molding us. He's not done helping us. He's not done equipping us. And heck no, he's not done using us. Just recently, I was praying for a few people and I felt him say, tell my kids I'm not done with them. My friends, he's not done with you. Even though you may have burned out, he's got one little ember still burning. You'll be back. Even though you feel unappreciated at work, he sees you. Don't grow weary in doing good. Even though you're getting older, there's no age restrictions with God. As we get older, we get wiser, we get stronger, we get more courageous. 
Even though people seem to keep picking others to do the things you feel God has led you to do, take heart. He's handpicked your mission. You have no idea. Even though you feel like the big wigs over you are making all the cash and the burdens are truly resting on your shoulders, hold on, friend. Help is on the way. God doesn't care about your sex, your weight, your color, your ethnicity, your inclinations towards certain habits your stutters or your limps. He loves you with a love that crosses human boundaries and can only be described as perfect. If God can speak through a donkey, he's just waiting for you to submit so he can use you. He doesn't care how inadequate you feel. He's adequate. He doesn't care how fearful you are. Perfect love drives out fear. He doesn't care how many people have told you you can't. He says you can, and you will with Jesus. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God is at work. Get out of his way and let him work in and through you. He's just waiting for you to say, yes, Lord, here I am. Use me. My friends, he's not done with you yet. You're still breathing, aren't you? For more on renewing your mind in the word of God, visit us at Unforsaken Women or check out our website, unforsakenwomen.com. Hope you enjoyed our program today. It's always interesting to push the pause button on our lives and take a look at how we're spending our days. Are we serving others? Are we sacrificing our time and resources? And if not, why? The Bible is pretty clear about offering our lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is our spiritual worship. I remember well my most recent experience being out of my comfort zone and having to sacrifice just a little. Now, it's not much, but it made an impact on my life. Freddie Clayton, who leads the ministry Orlando Union Rescue Mission, challenged me to be part of their yearly foot washing for our area's homeless population. We're talking about hundreds of men and women coming for a day of being served by our washing their feet feeding them, and giving them much-needed new shoes and socks. It sounded like something I was super interested in doing, and so I did. And I brought much of my family, including my three adorables, who, by the way, did great washing feet. I was deeply moved at the humility of others even, even allowing us to wash their filthy feet. I would never be the same again. I thought about how Jesus told his disciples that he, our Savior, must be allowed to let his friends wash his feet. The disciples were appalled at the thought of having someone like Jesus wash their feet. But what a great exercise in compassion and humility for them, and then for me as well. It was also a time for me to step out of my comfort zone, sacrifice ever so slightly, and serve in ways that would hopefully show the love of Jesus to those precious people. What I'm feeling convicted about is that the times we serve out of our comfort zones should far exceed when we serve comfortably. There is no sacrifice when it's easy, but the reward will always be great. And that, dear friends, is our note of hope for today. Thanks so much for joining us, and God bless you. You just watched Welcome Home with Barbara Beck, a Good Life 45 original production. That makes you a part of our hope team here on Good Life 45, where hope happens.